So given Kitty Hawk's interests and passions, you can imagine what a thrill it is to be able to speak this morning with someone who has been part of some of the world's most successful frontier tech startups. Steve Jurvetson is an early stage venture capitalist with a focus on founder-led, mission-driven companies at the cutting edge of disruptive technology and new industry formation. Steve has been part of some extraordinary companies. He was an early investor in SpaceX and Tesla and continues to sit on their boards. He's also an investor in Planet, Memphis Meets, Hotmail, D-Wave, and many more. Before co-founding his current form, firm, uh, Future Ventures, and before that, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, Steve was an R&D engineer at Hewlett Packard. He also worked in product marketing at Apple and Next and management consulting with Bain and Company. In 2016, President Barack Obama appointed Steve as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. He has also been honored as one of tech's best venture investors by Forbes and is the venture capitalist of the year by Deloitte. So it is a ridiculous resume. Uh, makes me feel bad about myself, but, but putting that aside, it's really such a great pleasure to be able to welcome today Steve Germanson. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Great to have you here. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought for today we would uh, divide our conversation into three main areas. So I want to talk about your uh, investment focus and kind of understanding how you make investment decisions. I want to talk about some specific technology areas. And then I want to talk about this extraordinary world that, that we're living in and, and investing in. Uh, and so maybe to kick things off, I thought we'd start off with talking about you know, what does frontier tech mean mean to you? How do you think about investing in some of these areas with these, you know, incredibly uh, long time horizons, looking at nascent technologies and, and industries? No, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, and that's what I've been focused on for, gosh, over 20 years now, uh, having started with internet investing, which I guess in the 90s was on the frontier and now is in the mainstream. And so I quite simply define the frontier as the things we haven't done yet. Um, and I think that's perhaps what all of this has been the frontier. You know, California is no longer the frontier, but there was a time when it was, right, um, and geographically. And so uh, how that translates to an investment thesis is kind of interesting in that you're always looking for something new and you're not able to rest on your laurels. So if there was a sector like energy and clean tech or synthetic biology or synthetic meat, uh, each of these has a time when it was new, when it was generally not regarded as a good idea by most investors, where it was fringe, where there were no market reports. Um, I might, in fact, put the entire space category in that sector only as recently as you know, 10, 12 years ago, when almost nobody was investing in the category, and now everyone is. So uh, quite simply, we are trying to find that next great technology wave, the next great frontier of the unknown. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be um, the, in fact, it often isn't sectors like you've had in the past. It'll be something new. It'll be something weird like agriculture or construction or, you know, certainly AI and a number of areas that we have been investing in are continuing to play out. So there's you know probably eight or nine different sectors along the frontiers of the unknown that we are exploring and investing in. But quite simply, we try to find things that are unlike anything we've seen before. And do you, um, you know, are you out there kind of with a thesis or are you and, and looking for companies or are you, you know, kind of more opportunistic and... You know, I'm curious as to how things start to kind of bubble up onto your radar and you start to uh, create a thesis that this is actually an emerging new industry that's forming or an important technology that I need to pay attention to. No, no, no that's, that's exactly right. I think every early stage venture firm has to think about this as their core strategy. How are they going to generate deal flow? How it will be sustainable over decades, not just this year? And you can't just chase the hot latest thing because that will be not particularly fulfilling over the long run. Uh, in terms of a strategy. So the, the simple answer is we try to, if you like, imagine trying to find a needle in the haystack metaphorically. You could go rifling through a bunch of haystacks or you could take your primary objective is pick the right haystack and then be a strong magnet next to that haystack. And maybe I'm stretching the analogy, but that's what we try to do. Pick an industry that we will use on the cusp of change, then announce that we're super interested in this, speaking at conferences, blogging about it, I'm active on social media to let people Generally, in a, in a fringe sector, we'll know if I'm interested in it long before most other venture capitalists do. Like, you know, 18 years ago was quantum computing, 10 years ago was space. Currently, it's synthetic meat and AI and a bunch of things. So, you know, being highly visible to the entrepreneurs helps them find you. Um, and so coming back to the primary objective, how do we do that? Well, we try to pick sectors that aren't yet overinvested. Um, so, you know, we're looking 
you know, beyond space, if you will, because space is, you know, wildly overinvested in our opinion at this point. Uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, there's certain areas where like, wow, if you've got over a hundred competitors doing the exact same thing, it's time to move on. Um, that's how I moved on from the internet. That's how I moved on from energy and clean tech, et cetera. So, um, so this opportunistic question is within each sector. So once we pick sectors of interest, we are absolutely opportunistic. Uh, it's not as if we will think of the next great idea because chances are it's not that great of an idea if we can think of it. Um, we have our socks blown off by some entrepreneur almost every week that did something we didn't think was possible that we never imagined before that stretches our own thinking into new domains. And whenever that set of neurons fire from a pattern recognition point of view, they get super excited. It's like, wow, most people think what you're doing is crazy. Most people think it won't work, but some people think it might. That's yeah, the best thing about the venture business, right? It's kind of the, the intellectual brain candy and these extraordinary entrepreneurs that uh, that you get to meet with and they do blow your socks off and look at the world and in ways you never could have imagined. That's right. That's exactly right. It's the greatest joy of our job, as you know. Yeah, yeah amazing. And are there certain things you look for in uh, companies themselves? Like, is it critical that there is a, you know, I, I'm guessing the answer is yes, but there has to be a, a deep, technology or some sort of very hard technological problem that they're solving? Are there, you know, will you invest in sole founders or do you always like to have kind of multiple founders as part of your, your? I, I guess I'm kind of getting to what is the formula that, that you've seen kind of uh, be most successful if there, if there is one? Sure. And, and I think you've already started to hit upon the answer, which is there's actually several filters operating in parallel, right? And it's a pattern recognition exercise honed over, in my case, over 25 years. So it's hard to make it formulaic like in a spreadsheet. We are analytical people, but we don't do analysis in terms of this weighting of these factors. So you first ask about the company, then about you know the team. So on the company side, yes, we generally lean towards tech-centric businesses simply because if there wasn't something disrupting the market, why would the new entrant have a chance? So you can think about electric vehicles in the automotive sector or SpaceX in the space sector. There were decades of no new startups succeeding, right? Take automotive, most people can do their own research on this front. Yeah, there was a big gap between Henry Ford and Tesla <laughs> and every investment made, and there were tons of them, lost all their money. So um, that's because nothing had changed. It was like a better design or, you know, a Fisker or, a, or a, you know, back at DeLorean or, you know, the Tucker. It's like, there's not a real reason why those products are any different from what's mainstream. They just look cute or they're like a, a whimsical little twist on a well-trodden path. So, um, so we do definitely look for a disruptive change. It's most often technology and most often driven by Moore's law, but it could be new channels of distribution like around mobility or the internet. Back in the day, we, we think that's been played out largely uh, as, as a sort of deep mine of opportunity. Um, but something has to be changing. We often ask ourselves the question and the asset entrepreneurs the question, why now? And what we mean by that is why couldn't this business have been started five years ago? And if there's no good reason, like literally this exact business idea could have started five years ago, we tend to take that as a major negative because good ideas don't just sit around ripe on the vine for five years and certainly not 10 years. Um, we might, like, it's five is on the edge, 10, we certainly wouldn't invest. It's like, no, like this, there's some reason this hasn't happened already if it's been sitting out there as a pregnant idea for 10 years. On the team side, we look for incredibly smart people who want to change the world, who are passionate, who are sort of missionaries, not mercenaries who truly have a vision of what the business looks like 20 years from now? That's a key question we ask. And if they just choke or laugh at the question, like what does your business look like 20 years from now? That alone, we won't invest. Like if they don't have that clearly laid out in their mind, it's clearly an arbitrage seeking opportunist. If instead they look relieved that finally someone asked them the question they wanna answer, which is not how we go in the market, what are the first five or 10 product iterations? It's like, what's the long game? What's the vision, the bright star on the horizon to which they're striving? be it Mars colonization for SpaceX or converting all vehicles to being electric vehicles for Tesla. I mean, that's a bold, audacious vision. It certainly was 20 years ago, a little less so today, a little more obvious that's going to happen. Um, that's what we look for in the people. And you asked about sole founders. We just find that statistically, you tend to have a dynamic duo, a Jobs and a Wozniak um, amongst all the great companies. Someone who behind the scenes is the operations introvert, the one who's managing the business. And the reason that's so helpful versus a sole founder cult of the CEO is that you tend to have higher cognitive diversity. That if the first two people in the company, like Jobs and Wozniak, are completely different from each other, yet respect each other's competencies, you will probably scale the cultural DNA of the firm to welcome diversity of cognitive styles, as opposed to clones of the CEO. And, you know, an army of salespeople that act like salespeople, that's the worst, right? A VP of sales CEO tends to do this more often than others, um, maybe because they don't understand other ways of thinking. I'm not sure why, I'd be guessing, but we see that as a common failure mode uh, of salesy type 
folks, uh, you know, schmoozing, and and that's all I got in the company, right? From the vice president ranks on down. Amazing. So um, I'm sure you get asked about this all the time, but you have had, you know, an incredible window into uh, at the board of uh, Tesla and SpaceX and gotten to interact with one of the, the greatest entrepreneurs, really, I think, of, of all time. Um, I'd love to just kind of quickly hear maybe some of the, the key takeaways from your uh, from your work and, and your time with Elon. Yeah, so I, I, hmm, I hesitate simply because I'm still working with them, and you know, it, it, it's it's almost like putting together a uh, analysis feels a little uh, inappropriate. But I would say, uh, at a high level, I agree with the premise of the question. I think he's the the greatest gift of the American dream we've seen in a long time, right? And and Jobs, you know, in a sense, uh, and others are part of that. People who can forge the future, who can start from modest beginnings, and re-engineer entire industries. And in the case of Jobs, partially, and Elon even more so, it spans multiple industries. It's not as if this is a one-hit wonder who only right. understands, you know, internet payment systems. You know, the difference between commercial banking, the, you know, the aerospace industry, the automotive industry, and now, you know, construction of tunnels and, and you know, neuroscience, these are pretty different, right? Um, and so it does, you know, further beg the question, you know, how can someone have nothing but success in this career path where statistically each of them is an incredible long shot? And so um, I guess I would point to Ashley Vance's book and, 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 and others that have come out to do the deeper dive. I would just share, here's someone who has an incredible ability to focus, like jobs, and ability to say no to thousands of interesting things that could distract you, speaking engagements, new product directions, how, how exactly you know, are we gonna create uh, you know, Mars infrastructure? Well, first we gotta get to Mars. So this, this singular focus on let's get Starship flying, then I'll focus on all these other interesting questions that are one step removed because if we don't solve this problem, we're not going to Mars. So at least with you know with, with you know boatloads of humans. Um, and, and grit, I would say, yeah. probably, right? What's that? And grit, right? His personal. Oh my God! Yeah, sticking to the 2008 December crisis where you know all the companies involved in are blowing up. Everyone's failed to fundraise, uh, including one of the best investment banks has failed to do a fundraising for Tesla. Um, nothing but rocket explosions on the SpaceX side. It's it's just incredible that he went all in and saved Tesla in his darkest hour. I mean, I've never seen an entrepreneur more committed to his companies uh, than him uh, you know, you know, by a long shot. Yeah, it's just amazing. So so deserves the success he is getting and, and just extraordinary to see one individual having such a, you know, outsized impact on the world. It's really, really mind blowing. Um, so let's shift into talking about some technologies. Uh, you are an investor in a fusion through Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Uh, what is the status of, of fusion energy? I mean, this is one with a you know very very long uh, time horizon, but it seems like we're starting to get get close to to having commercially viable fusion. I mean, it's still a little ways out, but um, anyway, I would love to get a quick update and kind of hear what the what the latest is there. Absolutely, you know, so nuclear fusion has been a back of back of mind dream for a long time. I, in fact, the first angel investment I ever made was 26 years ago in a nuclear fusion company that luckily quickly failed. I invested $200. So, <laughs> you know, sort of like my limit at the time of what my bank account could support in terms of angel investing. I mean, not $200,000, $200. Um, which is hilarious. So what is the status of the industry? So every year people say it's 10 years out and that's been the recurring joke that that's been the case for multiple decades. And because it's the easiest, it's like longer out than people ever going to like circle back and see if your forecast is accurate. So no one's saying, hey, it's next year or it's two years from now in terms of net energy generation. That's the important milestone the fusion needs to hit because there's plenty of experiments showing fusion. We have a fusion reactor, but it's more energy is pumping in than it's getting out. Right. right. Okay. So the general status in the industry, I put it two major buckets. There are a bunch of new science, basically what we try to avoid, which are science projects, areas where they haven't proven the physics or they haven't been able to build something that can withstand the heat or energy flux of a reactor, things where there's basic science still being done. That's the majority of them. There's all kinds of proton boron approaches, different approaches. Then there's the mainstream, these tokamak rings, where you basically spin a plasma and generate fusion. They've been shown the work. They've been shown the work at all different kinds of scales. This is everything from the MIT reactor, literally on campus at MIT, to this enormous one they're trying to build in Europe as we speak. So the physics community understands that the most and the investment we made with Commonwealth Fusion was along that path. And here's the, the amazing sort of status update is that we believe, and so does the physics community, that if they can just make the magnets a bit stronger than any magnet ever made before. So if you make a powerful magnet, the quality of the plasma goes up with the fourth power. And so you'll have a fusion reactor of a known performance if you can make the magnet. So then let's back up. What's 
what's going on in magnets. Well, superconducting wire has gotten produce, uh, reproducible enough at long enough strands that you can make a better superconducting magnet than has ever been made before. And so that's what they're doing first, making a powerful magnet, and they've done that. They know that when they put these in a ring, the net energy generation will be 10 times more than comes in. And so it has become an engineering challenge, not a science project. Just build the magnet wow. and the fusion happens. Mm. And that is remarkable. We think that's a watershed moment. That moment has happened cognitively in the minds of the physics community. Now they just got to go build it. And that's what they're doing. They're built in the process of building that first demonstration reactor that shows net energy generation for the first time. And by the way, once you cross that threshold, you'll make tens of thousands of these because it's better than coal or base band, base load power. It runs all day and all night. It's not using radioactive materials. It's not like the nuclear power plants of the past. You can think of it as it's closer to distributed solar, like the little sun burning with hydrogen and helium that is an abundant fuel we get from the ocean. It's not like uranium or plutonium. It's just like you just harvest this in the ocean, you fuse it together, and out comes clean, renewable, in a sense, renewable energy. I mean, you could argue there's a finite amount of hydrogen <laughs> isotopes in the ocean, but it'll last us a lot longer than coal or any of fossil fuels would last us. And would you, are these, you know, small plants? Are these, you know, would you imagine like the city of LA where I am, would they have one of these or would there be a bunch of these or California would have one? Good question. It, yeah. it, it can go at all scales. So um, initially for business reasons, you want to make the smallest or minimum efficient scale that makes sense, right? And there are some efficiencies as you get bigger, just simply, you know, running steam turbines, everything on a power plant can get better with scale. But you'd ideally do it for like a small township um, where you can make uh, purchase decisions a lot more easily, right? And especially in overseas markets, there are a lot of places where, you, you know, my gosh, they need this everywhere. Because almost every global challenge, whether it's water purification or you name it, if you had abundant clean energy, you can solve that problem, desalinate water in places that are going to need it. So, um, so eventually, though, it could be, uh, you know, competing with and at similar scales to the largest power plants out there. And do you think, is this five years away before we start to see the first commercial or 10 Never. years? Well, two to three years from that incredible moment where you've shown net energy generation. And I'm wow. saying two to three because they're estimating one to two, and I'm yeah. centering it a bit. Uh, so that, you know, in fact, it's likely to succeed because that alone is shocking to people. Like, what? Really? Two to three years? Nah. Um, and then the mega scale plant, the plant where it's more because this first one will be good. It'll generate energy, but you wouldn't be powering a town with it or a city. The next the one beyond that, which is called ARC. So the first one's called SPARC, S-P-A-R-C. The next one, ARC, A-R-C, um, is, is you know, utility scale. And that would take longer and take a larger amount of money. Uh, that's more like the five year guess that you just made. And how do you think about dilution when you're investing in a company like that? That's going to be, you know, clearly so capital intensive, going to have such a long time horizon. Uh, you know, you've, I think Future Ventures is a $200 million fund. Okay. Is that right? So how do you think about that? You know, maybe in my career, always focusing on getting like 30 to 40% ownership of companies. My first deals were like 700,000 pre-money, 1.2 pre-money. Generally, I was shocked if any company I would even look at was expecting more than 5 million pre-money, right? Mm -hmm. That was in the 90s. Um, so now you have companies like Commonwealth Fusion, quite a bit north of that for their Series A. Um, and I guess I've seen SpaceX and Tesla. I've seen, you know, single digit ownerships, like starting off around 5% uh, in both companies, getting diluted, right? And requiring billions of dollars of funding to get across the finish line. But I've also seen trillion dollar markets for the first time. You know, we would smoke at the notion of a trillion dollar market in the 90s. And in fact, all we invested in, in the venture industry was software, life sciences, and some of That was it in like 95. Mm -hmm. um, now it's incredibly diverse and you have these trillion dollar industries, you know, telecom and, and, and data communications, agriculture, uh, making humanity a multi-planetary species. I mean, what's that, right? That's crazy. That's like unprecedented from entrepreneurial precedent, right? You're like that. You know, what is that worth, right? <laughs> and I see a lot, you know, SpaceX Falcon Heavy behind you. So I'm sure you yeah. ask yourself the same question. You know, what would what would the new world be worth to you? How about uh, switching over? You want to talk about maybe uh, what's happening with Memphis Meat and, and kind of lab grown meats? Another just you know fascinating area that feels like we're right on the the cusp of some pretty uh, pretty extraordinary breakthroughs. That's a great one, and that's a great choice because that's one where. You know, for five, actually now it's been seven years, I've been looking for an investment. So back to your, one of your earlier questions, yeah. how do you, you know, choose things? I blog actively saying, I'm looking for a cellular agriculture. I use different terminology, basically, you know, growing meat without the slaughter, you know, doing it in the lab that can scale. And 3D printing won't scale. It's sort of obvious. You know, it's a linear mode. <laughs> like, there's no way. It's got to be continuous flow, uh, maybe semi-batch, but some sort of roll-to-roll -roll or equivalent process of generating meat 
you know, slabs of tissue that is the same as the host animal. So it is a piece of beef. It is a piece of chicken. It, you know, you all species, all types of animals. Um, so I knew this would, would be the future. By the way, so did Winston Churchill way back. You know, so mm -hmm. it's known to be the future, the inevitable future. There's no freaking way 500 years from now we're going to slaughter animals for meat, grow the entire animal, generate all the methane, take up the majority of land on Earth if we were to follow the current path. In like, China copies the U.S., most of Earth will have to be used to making meat. It's insane. If 40% of all arable land today is, it's, it's, most greenhouse gases in the methane category, the short-term negative greenhouse gases comes from agriculture. So that's ridiculous. Okay. Meat in particular. So we knew it was inevitable, but nothing, uh, you know, luckily we didn't invest in anything 10 years ago because it just hasn't scaled. Um, there've been some good plant-based alternatives. Let's applaud that, but that won't convert the entire market because it takes way too long to make an indistinguishably different, a similar product. And so cellular ag, addresses all meat initially right out of the chute. And so Memphis Meats was the first and only at the time company we saw that had cracked that nut. And so they have raised more money than any other cellular agriculture company. They're building their first uh, production plant as we speak. Uh, they've secured the factory, it's under construction. Um, we helped bring you know Richard Branson and Bill Gates and a bunch of other investors um, as, as well as, by the way, in, in the Series A uh, in, for a small check, but then later more, it was Cargill and Tyson, the two largest meat buyers in America. So it's interesting. Imagine you buy meat for a living and you look at the systemic risk of, you know, mad cow or swine flu fever in, in China. And you're like, my God, no matter how many suppliers I have, the entire infrastructure could go down from pathogens, if nothing else. And oh, by the way, you grow these things in a lab. There's no E. coli. There's no pathogens. There's no methane. You use 10 times less water, 10 times less food inputs, 10 times less land. It's just the obvious feature. And so the question though is, can you scale? It had been expensive, $10,000 a pound when we invested. Now it's approaching the cost of steak and eventually it'll be cheaper than it has to be, right? There's no way it couldn't be cheaper than the way we make an uh, meat today. We right. grow an animal, wait for it to grow, wait for it to grow, slaughter it. I mean, throw away much of it, it's ridiculous. And you can design in nutritional value, mm -hmm. taste, you know, appearance, yeah. all these things, right? You can, like, a, like a vendor, you can do blends. You could have salmon oils mixed with your steak to actually have it be a healthy steak that tastes better than anything you've had before. It's just the right fatty content. Think of all the work to get to a Wagyu steak. You like, right. oh, that more, right? right. It has to be healthy. Right. Amazing. Okay. Phase one, don't confuse the market with anything new and funky and weird. Right. Right. Phase one, just it's the same, right? Amazing. Um, and and so when do you think that's going to actually be hitting, start to, we'll see that in stores? This year, yeah. So you have yeah. some, some companies broadening from just Memphis Meats. You have some companies sampling today, uh, and Memphis Meats absolutely can do the same, which is, you know, hey, let's have a sit down uh, yeah. dinner with some chefs and, and, and thought leaders and partners and show them what it's like, let them have a taste. That That's happening as we speak. The the ramp up and the crossover on price would be later this year, meaning, you know, where it gets cheaper than regular Got Amazing. Okay, so now let's shift into our, our last category, and uh, and we'll touch on a you know a bunch of different subjects here. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, longevity. And uh, you know we've had we had Peter Diamandis on a couple months ago, and kind of talking about uh, how old we all thought we were going to live. I'd be curious to to hear kind of how old you think you're going to live to be. Oh well, it keeps changing. Um, I would hope well over 120, um, but. You know, with each passing year, that number might change. So you have to check back in. And so I, I don't know that I can yet do the recursive algorithm to say, given the pace of progress, do I believe it will continue unabated? Session I might go to 130. And oh, by the way, will I catch this benefit? Or will my daughter Luna catch it? Right? Like, you know, right. So it'd be easier bet to bet on the next generation. Um, and there's a lot of interesting and, and, and tantalizing work coming out of Dave Sinclair's lab at you know at Harvard, yep. as well as and by the way, full disclosure, we have investment in Cambrian, which is a uh, distributed R&D company or disco, basically, as they call it, um, that has an umbrella of about 10 different companies working on different parts of the hallmarks of aging, which are different elements. So let me roll back. Why do you want a hallmark of aging? Imagine you're trying to cure well, cardiovascular disease. Wouldn't it be great if you had a biomarker, an indicator of your heart's health before it falls apart, like your cholesterol level, where you could say, hey, I, as the FDA, might want to approve drugs like statins that lower cholesterol because I know that downstream that'll help human health and longevity along that dimension. Um, if you just simply reduce cholesterol, right? At the moment of death, you can't say, ah, the cholesterol poisoned him, right? The cholesterol was so high that he died of cholesterol poisoning. It's more, no, a, you know, decades of fatty, you know, arterial plaques and what have you has led to the heart attacks and what, and, and hypertension, what have you. So by analogy, imagine you could figure out what is your, your chronometer of age and Sinclair and a bunch of others have done some amazing work 
I'm figuring out the epigenetics of this, figuring out, in the case of, of Sinclair, these methylation side chains that are almost like analog information on your genome, that with each cell division and as you age, it becomes noisier. And we might, in his case, see this as a noise problem in the analog information systems of our biology. And that may have a singular cure, if you will, um, curing aging as a disease. And those words often strike people as like off-putting, like, what do you mean? aging as a disease. It's normal. We all age. That's what we do, right? There, there'll be a different way we look at that in the future. So, you know, companies we've invested in, uh, in, in this Cambrian framework are tackling all kinds of other hallmarks of aging, everything around heart rate variability, around different parts of um, fibrosis occurring in areas of your tissues. And if you can deal with each of those, you might be able to extend life across the board. So, you know, stepping back, and I'm sure your investment thesis shares this, it's not, don't wait till someone needs a patch or a fix because systems are broken. Figure out how to extend healthy living, not end of life patches, but, you know, propagation of midlife healthiness. Um, that's why I wonder which side of that fence I'm on. I'm hoping I'm on the, on the healthy side. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, David Sinclair specifically, it's been amazing to see what he's doing in his lab and how they're able to actually kind of roll back the age of cells now and mice and restore vision and uh, previously blind mice. I mean, really, you feel like we are on the cusp of some extraordinary breakthroughs in these areas. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, maybe let's talk a little bit about this you know, the accelerating pace of change right now. I'm sure you're, you're feeling it. Certainly my sense uh, is that, you know, then the data I think seems to uh, support this, that things are, the change is accelerating, right? And so how do you think about uh, the world we're, we're moving into? How do you think about kind of staying on top of these, uh, these trends? No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it's, the driver of perpetual opportunity for startups. So first thing is accelerating change in some sense is the juggernaut that allows entrepreneurs to have a chance to upset the incumbents most often. Uh, occasionally, it's just an incredibly brilliant new business idea you know, in the business domain. It, those are really rare. Um, and uh, it also is reweaving re and, and warping the fabric of society and cultural evolution itself. So I think humanity, the way we live as a, as a people is obviously going through change. Think about technologies that affect reproductive independence, um, women's rights, you know, all these things that percolate out from some technology changes, which are pretty interesting. So um, as you guys, I can grab something as a visual. Look at this, 120 years of Moore's Law. I can now honestly say I've shown this in every presentation I've ever given for about 20 years now which shows how much computation a dollar can buy over 120 years. And so, you know, the integrated circuit on, yeah. the other side of the, uh, on this side of the page, you know, is only the most recent epoch. We have all, you know, transistors, mechanical devices. This is, by the way, a logarithmic scale. So every tick mark is 100x. So a straight line, line is an exponential. The point, the takeaway of this, Moore's law, as we commonly call it, is a refraction, a longer term trend that's been going for 120 years. Kurzweil and Singular University were founded on this, as you know. Yeah. So anyone, anyone on the call who doesn't know this, curve by heart, please look it up. Look up Ray Kurzweil's, you know, you know, you know long-term abstraction of Moore's Law. It's what really matters. It's the most important thing ever graphed, in my opinion. And, and probably quantum yeah. computing on that maybe is the next era, right? Yeah. yeah absolutely. And, and also dedicated machine learning chips. Because by the way, on that, it's not like Intel has only a few data points. The most recent 10 years has been NVIDIA. So the GPUs from NVIDIA are the 10 years of most recent data points on that curve there will be other chips, right? It's not Intel. So everything, in, Intel has lost the mantle of Moore's Law, even though Gordon Moore was a co-founder of Intel. It's like, no, they don't matter at all in this future. It's NVIDIA and it'll be machine learning and neural network chips that implement basically the majority of computation today, almost 90% at Google and soon 90% of all computation will be software generated by a machine through an iterative algorithm called deep learning or machine learning or generative design in, in, the, in the physical design space where, um, where you can do so much more. You can build complex systems that transcend human understanding, that can do more than any human could themselves or they could possibly understand even if they dedicate the rest of their life to figuring out how they work. And we are at that transition across a variety of fields, from medical imaging to you know, simple image and video recognition systems to eventually healthcare you know, diagnosis, uh, not just uh, on the visual side, but on complex uh, parsing of human speech, you name it, right? This is the inevitable future and um, and so it is like really shocking, right, for people to get a taste of this for the first time. It's, it's generally what feels like magic when you first experience it, like a really good voice recognition system or a really good autonomous car. If like if someone hasn't been in a Tesla yet and gets in one right now on the latest software build, their mind is blown, right? It feels like magic. And that writ large is going to happen with almost every product and service. 
through machine learning, deep learning, and, and it's going to be that perpetual future shock where it feels like, oh my God, every year it feels like we're going through more technological change than we remember, and that is the norm every year in and year out. Like, you, think, perpetual future shock. Yeah. You, know? you think we adjust to that, and and that we become kind of more and more comfortable with that, or how how do you think humans? Yeah, actually, I don't. I, don't, I, don't I think well, human nature is glacial. I don't think we change. Yeah atomically at all. I think the only thing that does change on the scale of decades is culture, meaning our norms, our beliefs, the way we choose to organize, the way we live for the betterment of humanity, for the you know the maximization of human ha flourishing and happiness, the way Sam Harris might put it. And I think we're getting better at that at a scale we don't recognize year in, or even, you know, certainly not month to month, uh, the, the glacial pace of almost cultural evolution itself. You can think of it as our memes, our ideas, not the graphics on the web, but, but the, the more generic term meme, is really a vector of evolution today. That is it's so much faster and so much more impactful than anything in biology. Right? Sure, biology evolution continues slowly, but you know that some future CRISPR edit or some AI that we spawn or, or a better sense of how to organize the way we live will have more impact on human flourishing or suffering than someone you know getting a better neuron. That's ridiculous. Of course, that's not going to happen in our in our lifetimes or in the next you know thousand years. Um, or anything else that might be biological pace of progress. It's glacial, right? So the latest level of abstraction is where all evolutionary progress occurs. That's now beyond the human to culture, ideas, technology artifacts, and, and the artificial technology artifacts that we create. So how do you think about that given um, the kind of antiquated control systems that we we have in place? I mean, the, the democracy versus autocracy, you know, kind of the importance of, of nation states. It feels like the world is changing so rapidly, yet uh, at least in the U.S. where we have a democracy, things move very, very slowly, and it really is inhibiting progress, right? And, and there's some real structural uh, risks that are that are starting to appear now. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've always believed that much of the U.S. Constitution's beauty and efficacy is to retard change, to make it near impossible for the president to do anything. Right? You can declare war, you know, and you can try to rally others, but ultimately you run into the quagmire of, uh, of bureaucracy. And so bureaucracy has the singular benefit of slowing everything down a little bit, um, because you know, when it comes to governance, that may be the safer bet than you know radical swings of offenses. What you would like to see is experiments being run, right? Like charter cities, charter nation states at a smaller scale, um, regions where people choose to move there under a new form of governance uh, voluntarily, uh, like Shenzhen was when it first started and, and trading with the West, where you might experiment more than you do today. So I would love to see a, a process of perpetual innovation in governance um, mayors at cities generally get more stuff done. That feels like the right sort of scope, not massive multi-hundred million dollar groups of people, but perhaps city-states. Um, this is partially why city-states seem to be thriving as Singapore or Hong Kong. And then when they get sucked into the, the maw of a larger organization, they don't thrive as much. Um, uh, at least you would predict that that would be the case and the productivity would go down. So, uh, so I think there should be more. I think, by the way, there's a bigger issue separate from governance. Governance is important. Um, a much bigger issue, I think, is going to be perpetuating um, inequality uh, and ever, excel ever accelerating technology-driven rich-poor gap. Um, I don't think it's self-rectifying. I don't think it's like, oh, we had some thing and it's like an economic cycle. No, I think it's actually a power law that just keeps growing in perpetuity. Um, and we as a society haven't figured out what is the method by which you want to deal with extraordinary, escalating, exponential differences in wealth across the population in a power law. Um, yeah, and, and I think technology advances while we invest in them and celebrate them, and they better they they help humanity across the board on average. They further polarize humanity in the same process. Mm -hmm. It's a winner take all dynamic and network effects, all those things um, yeah. are underlying in the future. Every business, when every business becomes an information centric business, they'll look more like our tech businesses, right? right? And, and 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 about so at the, at all fractal scales. Like which country is richer than other countries, which region is richer than other regions, which company is better than all other companies. Like there's only one that matters, maybe two or three that are, you know, also ran in any given sector. And then, oh, by the way, individual careers within those companies, the CEO and a few people at the top taking the majority of the spoils at every fractal scale, there's this massive power loss. And the people left behind are left scratching their heads and, and, and sort of rejecting modernity at every scale. Countries that reject modernity, math and science, turn to other ways of finding fulfillment and meaning in life to the individual who you know, might live a magical thought process instead of a scientific method of thought process. Mm -hmm. How far and how quickly are they going to be left behind is, is disturbing and worrisome. Steve. 
Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you all of you for joining us today. It really has been a terrific uh, conversation, some great questions, lots of really terrific uh, insights. So Steve, continued success, my friend. Great to see you and thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Well.